The texts tell us that the Buddha surveyed the world many times during his career, and the results depended on whether it was before his awakening or after his awakening. Before his awakening, he looked at the world and he realized he was looking for happiness in the world. Yet what, what did the world have to offer? He said it was like fish in a stream that was drying up, fighting one another over that last bit of water. Everywhere he looked, everything was already laid claim to, and it pained his heart. But he realized it wasn't just sorrow. It was because he wanted something out of the world. That was the arrow in his heart. That was the arrow he's going to have to pull out. But he had to figure out the way out. It took him a long time. But on the night of his awakening, again, he surveyed the world after seeing that he, he himself had been reborn many times. He wanted to figure out why. What was the mechanism? What caused this to happen? Because if he could see the cause, then maybe he could put an end to it. So he directed his thoughts to the passing away and the re-arising of beings. And he saw that it was based on action, and the actions were based on views. The actions, of course, were intentions. So he looked in the third watch of his night at his intentions to see if is there an intention that can lead to the end of this incessant cycle? Are there views that can lead to the end of this incessant cycle? And he discovered that there were. That's how he pulled out the arrow. And after his awakening, he surveyed the world again. At this point, he didn't want anything out of the world. It was simply to see what he'd escaped from. Beings running around on fire. Passion, aversion, and delusion were burning their hearts. And so that's how he began to think maybe he might teach. This is a point in his life that the commentaries get all upset about, because after all, he was going to become the Buddha anyhow, right? He was going to teach. And that after his awakening, he began to realize how difficult it was going to be. And you look at his life, and you can see there was full of difficulties after his awakening in trying to get the Dharma out there. Here he had been working so hard to find something of real value, and he was offering it for free. And there are a lot of people who wouldn't take it, and they would attack him. But then he realized there would be people who would benefit, who would be willing to listen. So for them he taught. But the important thing was he didn't want anything out of the world at that point. As he said later, to be a good teacher, you find that when people follow your teachings, you're satisfied. But you don't let that satisfaction overcome your mind. When you teach people and they don't follow the teachings, of course you're not going to be satisfied. But again, you don't let dissatisfaction overcome your mind. You teach because you know it's a good thing to teach. And it's there for everyone who will take it. So the lesson we have here, the lesson we can learn from this, is that when we look at the world and we feel sorrow over the way the world is going, we have to ask ourselves, what can we do for the world? The best thing we can do for the world is to find that solid center inside that the Buddha found, so that we too can be in a position where we don't want anything out of the world, and then we can offer things totally out of compassion. Now, before we can reach that point, we have to develop a solid center in terms of concentration, which may not be totally solid. 
doesn't get rid of all of our desires with regard to the world, after all. We need to eat, we need to have food, clothing, shelter, medicine in order to practice. But we realize that the real problem, the arrow in the heart, is right there. It's in the heart. And we are the ones who shot ourselves with the arrow. So we're going to have to pull it out. So the best response to all the trouble in the world is to find a solid place in your heart. One, so that you won't have to suffer as the world suffers. You'll have your own independent source of well-being. That's for your own good and for the good of others. You're in a better position to figure out what you can do that would actually be helpful to them. After all, think of the Buddha. He may have had ideas about how to teach the Dharma before he gained his awakening, but it wasn't until he gained his awakening that he really knew this was how he had to teach. He knew that he had something of value. And he knew how he had found it. So that determined how he was going to teach. And the fact that he wasn't going to get upset about people who disagreed with him, people who listened to him and then went off someplace else. That was what enabled him to stick with it. Because it can get discouraging. You teach people to go east and they go west. You teach people something good and they just toss it away. But the Buddha knew that he had something of real value. So the opinions of the world didn't have that any meaning to him. We've got to learn how to develop our minds so that we can have that kind of solidity if we really want to be helpful to the world. Otherwise we just become one more voice in the clamor. One more person trying to lay claim to things that everybody else would like to lay claim to. And that doesn't solve the problem at all. The solution to the problem lies inside. And the qualities you develop. This is the basic message of the Buddha's teachings on noble treasures, what the tradition later worked up into the list of the Ten Perfections. That despite the ups and downs of the world, there's something of solid value that you can build into the mind. That's not wiped away. For the things that wipe away the, the treasures of the world or the accomplishments of the world or the powers of the world. You see people abusing the power they have in the world. I remember listening to a lawyer one time who had argued a lot of cases in front of the Supreme Court, and he'd seen the change in the court. It seemed to be going in one direction, the direction he wanted it to go in. And then, as they changed the members of the court, it started going the other direction. He felt that his whole career had been a waste. If you measure your worth as a person in terms of what you can do in the world or the effect you can have in the world, you're setting yourself up for a fall. But if you measure the worth of your life in terms of the qualities you can build into the mind, Then you're operating on your own territory. And it's not a selfish quest. The more solidity you can develop inside, the more things of solid worth you're going to have to offer to people who are interested. And that's the most that a human being can do for anyone else. So as you survey the world, 
Look into your heart. Try to find where that arrow is, the arrow that leads to the sorrow or the frustration or whatever you feel as you look at the world. And remember, it's the arrow that has to be pulled out, the problem in the heart that has to be solved. But because it is in the heart, it's something you can solve. That's the Buddha's message. And we have it because he didn't let him, <coughs> the world get him discouraged. He maintained the solidity of his heart all the way to the end. The end of what we could see of him. Of course, there was no end to that solidity. That's what makes it so good.